Good morning, everyone. This is John Kogan. I'm the CEO of Performative, the online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. First, I would like to welcome everyone to this morning's webinar, uh, or I guess this afternoon, depending on where you are, entitled Financial Planning, Budgeting, and Forecasting, How Best-in-Class Companies Plan in Today's World. Advances in technology are creating opportunities to realize the benefits of creating better alignment of budgeting and forecasting efforts with strategic initiatives and operating in a dynamic financial planning environment. What does it mean for a company to move from a static to a dynamic for, uh, forecasting environment? How are companies leveraging technology and redefining processes to offer the right data at the right time to the right people within their organizations? This webinar will offer a number of key best practices being utilized by companies on the forefront of budgeting and planning and includes a case study of how one company has reaped the benefits of transforming from a static to a dynamic forecasting and planning process. We have a few items before we get started this morning. First off, I'd like to thank Host Analytics uh, for graciously helping us to make this event possible. Everything that we do on Performative is free for the users of Performative, and it's through companies like Host Analytics and their generosity sponsoring events like this uh, that that is possible. So thank you to Host Analytics. They also have provided us some of the content for today's event, and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, a quick welcome to Performative for those who are new to Performative. Uh, Performative is the largest and fastest growing online resource for senior finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. Uh, we reach over 600,000 of these folks on a monthly basis. Uh, this is a unique resource. Folks come online, they ask questions, they get answers, uh, get answers uh, from their peers. So it's a wonderful way uh, to learn about anything on the job. Uh, even if you've never experienced it before, um, chances are someone in our community, which is very large, has. Uh, and it's simply a free and noise-free exchange of information. Uh, the entire platform is free. There's no advertising, no self-promotion, etc. cetera. Uh, please check it out at performative.com. Next up, a few notes on the event today. A link to today's presentation and a video of this webinar uh, will be sent out to all attendees within 24 hours of the event and is already posted on performative.com slash resources. Uh, so it's already available if you want to go out and grab it. Um, at performative.com slash resources, and we will send an email out that will have a link uh, to the deck and a link to the video of the webinar, which we're recording right now. Next up, there are many in the audience who are pre-registered for CPE credits. Um, if you are, then you will need to answer the polling questions. We have three polling questions today. Um, and they are statistical in nature, so even if you're not here for CPE credit, we'd appreciate your taking 10 seconds and answering them anyway. Uh, and then at the end of today's event, we will revisit these questions and we'll see what everyone had to say. Um, we don't share the names of, uh, of uh, the folks who answered, so don't worry. No one else will see uh, your name. They'll just see uh, the aggregated numbers in response to the poll questions. Please feel free to ask questions on today's topic via the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. You can ask those questions at any time. Uh, typically, we hold questions uh, until the Q&A period, which is the last section of this morning's webinar. Um, however, if there's an interesting clarifying question, we'll go ahead and sneak it in as we go. Finally, when you uh, finish today's webinar and step off, or when we shut the webinar down, uh, you'll be asked to take a short survey. It is literally 60 seconds. We greatly appreciate the feedback. We always want to do better the next time, and uh, your feedback greatly helps us uh, on that front. Uh, also, if you have any desire to connect with either of today's two speakers, we make it very easy to do so. Uh, simply check the box. Uh, or the box is during uh, your taking of that short survey, and we'll happily connect you with uh, one or both of the speakers today. Uh, a couple learning objectives. Um, the bottom line is today we want to share a number of uh, best-in-class practices uh, in uh, today's world of budgeting and forecasting, um, and we're going to be covering a lot of ground in terms of what companies are doing on that front, and we'll hear about what one company did uh, from one of the folks who's in charge of budgeting and forecasting at that company. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and uh, get us on that path. And starting us off this morning is Rob Friscone, Solution Consultant at Host Analytics. 
Rob brings to Host Analytics over 14 years of experience in business software, primarily in the enterprise resource planning space. Rob comes to Host Analytics from Lawson Software, where he is a solution consultant in Lawson's public sector group. During his career, Rob has served in a variety of finance roles and is also an expert in software revenue recognition. Rob began his career in public accounting and is a CPA. He also holds an MBA in finance. Now with that, Rob, I'd like to invite you to take it away. All right, thanks, John. Well, I just wanted to you know, give everyone an overview today of you know what we're going to be talking about. Of course, the topic is you know financial planning, budgeting, and forecasting. But you know to narrow it down a little bit, uh, and I'm breaking up my presentation really into to, to a couple of different you know, perspectives. And one, I want to just give you you know our perspective on what we've seen as just the evolving role of finance. You know, how how is finance and you know finance departments gone from number crunchers and, and data gatherers and report preparers to you know, true business partners. Um, you know, number two is is just talking about some best practices that can really get you there to that kind of nirvana of, of you know building those relationships with the business by you know being a true business partner, being involved in the strategic you know, decision making process. And you know, number three is really the underpinning of, of the whole presentation. That's you know how do you leverage technology to get you there? So that's essentially what we're going to be talking about today. So. When you think about the evolving role of finance, I'm sure you know we've all thought about it over the years to, in in our careers. Um, you know the role is changing, and you know, it gives a little de depiction of you know how those those roles are changing. And really, to kind of you know begin that discussion, I mean, just think about how dramatic that's been. So when I look back through my career, and I look back about 10 years ago when I was in corporate finance with the you know large you know publicly traded software company, and I remember how backwards. You know, looking at our perspective was we we had so much focus on closing the books and consolidating all of the data that we barely had enough time to prepare our you know historical reporting for our our, our public company reporting for the SEC, et cetera. And that we had no time at all to do any real analysis, you know, or any true you know budgeting and, and forecasting. And you know, because of all that, we just weren't seen as as a business partner, really at all, you know, we were all focused on just reporting, you know, those financial results. So, you know, you, you fast forward a little bit to now, you can see that that role has changing, you know, and the focus has changed from, you know, that of uh, historical results and, and auditing to much more of a proactive, you know, business partner approach within that in, within the organization. And I think the biz biggest reason for this is that you know the business demands it it has to happen to, to survive in today's environment you know it was a different world than it was 10 15 or, or even five years ago and you know the business requires that finance be its partner you know to model out to look out in the future to help it understand you know most importantly what are the impl implications of all the different courses of actions going to be what do they look like so that you can make an informed decision you know when the time actually comes and you know to do all this you need you need data, and the data needs to be much more real time. It's no longer good enough for you know to look out uh, weeks or or months. You need to be able to you know look at the data in a much more flexible manner, and that means you can't look at it in a single dimension anymore, by cost center and account. And thankfully, there's been you know advancements in in the terms of technology that will make this possible. So the trend is that you know finance departments are moving away from focusing on historical results to focusing on driving business performance and profitability. And you know, really driving business results. And so the focus of this webinar really is that you know, how can finance leverage technology to enhance their evolving role as they become more you know involved in that strategic decision making process. So you know, we've talked to a number of our customers and prospects. You know, that's what we do on a regular basis. We have discussions with them. We ask them how their businesses are are, are going and what their planning process looks like. And so I just want to share a little bit about you know what we're we're hearing there. So. What we found is there are a lot of issues that finance departments are facing, and you know, these issues are really serving as barriers to you know finance departments serving as strategic partners in, within their organizations. And we need to break down those barriers in order to kind of propel them forward, you know, into that particular role. So I want to just kind of walk through some of these things. So some are are, are pretty basic in nature. With an Excel-based planning system, you have version control issues. You know, broken links, and you have errors. And, and some of these errors, and there have been some studies that have, have uh, indicated that you know 80% of plans done in Excel have some kind of error that uh, organizations don't even know about because they can't find those particular errors. So known errors and, and unknown errors. 
And what does this lead to? It leads to you know long nights. It leads to staff burnout because it's really just not a process. It, in the terms of uh, reporting deficiencies, you know there's a true inability to be able to just present the information in a in a you know board quality format. And some of this is related to problems associated with getting at the data, uh, just to you know have it available for reporting and analysis. And the desire to be able to quickly answer you know questions uh, that management raises via just true ad hoc reporting tools, where you can drag and drop you know dimensions to get an answer to a question very very quickly without the help of IT. Uh, in addition, just being able to drive visibility and accountability through your organization by utilizing you know data visualization and you know scorecard scorecarding capabilities that are inherent in, in dashboards. Scenario modeling, you know, how do we model out these large events that may or may not happen? You know, acquisitions, new product lines, new channel partners. You know, how do we get a view of that, you know, with, with good detailed data so that we can make decisions um, ahead of time you know, that are accurate, that can add value to the business? And you know, uh, finally, you know, the strategic plans you know, are not really driven to operations. There's still a true disconnect between the strategic planning process done at one layer of the organization and you know the operational and financial budgeting and planning process that really is done at, at a, a, a different part of the organization, and this is just leading to you know decisions that are being made in a vacuum, since there's no real tie between these operational and decision and uh, strategic plans. And finally, just you know the the, the need um, to be able to you know have, have the functional decisions incorporate operating and financial implications. So I mean, as you can see, as we solve. You know, some of the business or the process efficiency related issues, we begin to move closer to improving you know, the overall organizational performance. So the two are really inextric inextricably excuse me, tied together. So when you think about the evolution of financial applications that kind of get us to today, you know, we kind of go through a couple of different generations. And the first thing I want to say about all that is that you know, technology is really helping to really change that landscape. You know, if you think about the first generation of financial and you know, planning applications, um, you know, it really just was focused on just generating budgets. You know, just basic data aggregation. And so it's pretty basic functionality, and it didn't really allow for much time for an actual review of the data that was being entered and aggregated. You know, if there's just a small amount of time left after all that work was done for just a little bit of review, people were typically happy. You know, and with that came you know, simple consolidation, really basic, you know, iteration control, you know, just having the core ability to manage the process through a system, um, and just rudimentary dashboarding and reporting. And, you know, most of the first generation um, uh, was really, you know, comprised of, um, you know, just first generation apps, the financial apps, and Excel. And that really made it up. We move into, you know, the second generation of financial applications. And we kind of add on top of, of what we had in, you know, uh, originally. So we just to kind of take the next step on top of that core system or Excel-based based planning tool that, you know, organizations were using. And we built in, you know, some basic, you know, modeling and, you know, drivers in that process. So we had the beginning of being able to analyze different scenarios or just the effect of certain, you know, changing uh, drivers in that process. And you know certain things like you know reducing uh, operating expenses by by five percent and being able to, to see that flow through to your business, to your P and L, and your cash flow, and your balance sheet. So you know just the, the early on was just the beginnings of being able to you know just get to that point where you could try to model out scenarios to you know make better decisions when the time came. And again, those those second generation uh, second generation uh, applications were typically you know more advanced Excel applications or you know just the second generation of you know, the core financial applications. The third generation is really where we're we're at today, and you know what that really in includes is you know software as a service software as a service based CPM solutions or corporate performance management solutions. And you know, just the next generation of the overall you know CPM group of applications. So we've extended the functionality of financial applications 2.0, if you will, and we add some additional you know pieces of functionality that are are really core. And it's really all about getting to fact-based decision making. So you know, to get to this level, you need to be able to tie your strategic plans back to your operating plans. You, know, you need to be able to tie your company's strategy to the results. Of, of operations, you know, to those financial results, and, and to do this, 
you have to have some cohesiveness between you know, those who, individuals who are setting your company's strategic vision, you know, typically executive management, and back even down to the line level, level managers who are you know, intimately, intimately involved excuse me, in you know, the preparation of the annual budget, including you know, some of the finance team members who are intimately involved in that process. So you, know, you really need to ensure that there's a cohesiveness, if you will, you know, between those two processes. And finally, you know, it's again, it's it's about bringing back together, you know, core finance and, and operations. You know, I think gone are the days when when finance can sit in the background and just report actuals. That that's you know, ten twenty years ago or so. There's got to be an understanding as to you know the financial implications, what the financial implications are, you know, as well as you know, the operational impacts. And this really goes both ways. You know, as changes in operations are made. Let's say it's something like changes in a production run. You know, those individuals and in operations need to be cognizant of the financial implications of those decisions as well. So these impacts, you know, also need to be able to you know, flow up the chain, you know, to the top. And you know what this all really leads to is, you know, at the end of the day, the ultimate measurement for for most businesses, I would argue, any business is its profitability. You know, improvement in profitability is is a result of you know, stronger ties between the company strategy and, and uh, finance and operations. It involves fact-based decision making, and you know both of these are really the result of process imp improvements, and that's enabled in part by you know, utilization of the most uh, the most current technology. And you know again, that's really what the focus of you know corporate performance management applications are are really all about. So you know where are we today? Um, you know, unfortunately, you know we we talk to a lot of a lot of businesses, a lot of prospects, and you know I'm always surprised at the the numbers of those businesses, and some are, are very large that still utilize a spreadsheet based Excel uh, planning process for either their whole business at the corporate level or you know just for some of their divisional businesses. So that's still very prevalent today. So it's really that you know the current lay of the land. And a lot of companies are still doing that. And you know our view on this is that Excel and the popular you know, spreadsheet packages are they're very powerful desktop productivity tools, but they're not good tools for budgeting and planning, and they're not good tools for collaboration. There's an overall lack of control, you know, both both in versions of you know, plans or budgets or forecasts, and you know, related to the underlying you know, integrity of of the data. You know, what about the errors? That you know, you know you, that you know exists, but you can't locate in that plan. You know, and I, I talked about that a little bit before. They're out there. How do you measure them if you can't even find where they are? If you don't even know where they may be lurking in your plan, and that's all. You know, leads us to you know in, inaccurate data, and we've all been there. You know, broken formulas, added, deleted in rows and columns. You know, locking down a spreadsheet only to find out that. Someone buttered up one of your finance uh, analysts to to uh, give that uh, password out. You know the, the lack of control. You know ultimately leads to doubts about accuracy, and that affects credibility and affects ownership, and it, it really breeds distrust. And I mean that, I think it's what ultimately leads to lack of accountability for results. And it, it's still a large problem. If you don't trust the numbers, you're not going to own the numbers. And if you don't own the numbers, you're not going to own the results of of uh, you know what you're doing in your business. So let's talk about what these nine steps are to, to better planning, and, and we'll talk about you know how technology plays a role you know in that. So that's really what we're going to talk about for the, the, the remaining part of you know my portion of uh, of the presentation. Just some different strategies to kind of get you from where you are today to where you want to be. So we're going to build up a little cake here in the middle in, in this uh, little diagram. And the diagram really represents you know, your organization. And you can see the little, little labels on there. And it's, it's really the whole organization as, as a piece of a puzzle, from manufacturing to sales and marketing to, to finance and administration and, and operations. So we're going to build this up uh, over the course of the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so. And the first thing that you know, we want to get out there and share is that you need to, sus to systemize your planning process. And you know, what that really needs to me is you need a system. And Excel is not a system. Um, you know, Excel is a great you know, personal productivity tool, but it's simply not a system. You know, and the next, the, the next nine best practices that we're going to outline, uh, you know, just functionality and, and other practices that will really you know, 
show you how that you know, outstrips the, the capability of Excel spreadsheets and, and you know, why you need something uh, more systemized if you're going to get to that next level, you know, that, that point where you are a true business partner. And that's, you know, we all know, that's the result of, of having enough you know, process efficiency in your planning process and accuracy so that you can spend time on the things that you really care about. You know, and, and I think it's the reason why a lot of people may tend to get out of finance is what they thought it was going to be like when they got into it is not what it turned out to be. There's a lot of time still spent on, on reporting and still not enough time focused on building those relationships you know, with the business. And you know, that comes with credibility. So Excel can get you part of the, part of the way there. But you know, as you think about this next step that you're going to take as an organization, um, you know, building those better relationships, improving your processes, and you know, building in more integrity into that plan and more efficiency into that plan, Excel just isn't going to get you there. So you need a system that's specifically designed for business planning. And that's really ultimately what a corporate performance management solution or CPM solution really does. Is it helps you drive financial and operational results in order to execute your business plan. That's about as succinctly as I can, I can say it. Um, and it does that by you know, eliminating bottlenecks and inefficiencies in the business process. So when you think about the broken links and formulas and manually rolling up or aggregating your data, you know, these things essentially go away with a, a, C, a CPM solution. They're automatic. I mean, that's what you should expect from a tool like that you know, if you're out and, and when you're looking for a, a CPM tool. And they're done in real time. So no more shooting uh, emails around with Excel spreadsheets you know, with the username and password uh, you know, for the SaaS-based systems. You can log in anytime, anywhere. and in real time be able to look at that data. All the users can get in the system at the same time and see it. So, and just referencing what I said before, this leads to that additional time for the finance team. You know, finance teams want to add value, but to do that they have to have the time in, in order to be able to do that. And it's not just you know, related to finance, it's other parts of the organizations as well. And this time can be used for you know, higher value activities. So the finance team can start working on streamlining the planning process or just being more involved in analyzing strategic options. And you know, they may even ha end up having more time, believe it or not, to maybe go out to lunch with someone in the business that they know that they work with on a regular, pace, regular basis, get to know those people, get to build those relationships um, you know, to, to strengthen those future ties uh, for the future of the business. And it's just not re just reserved for finance. You know, all department managers who are involved in the process are going to be able to free up more time to focus on what they want to focus on. And that's, managing their business. So you know, we talked about some of the, you know, the process improvements that we can use to, to get us there. So the first one is, is really, the second one is, is rolling forecasts. So we've all heard about rolling forecasts. And really it's just tied to that continuous planning cycle. So we're continually, continuously monitoring our business. And to do that, we're determining you know, what are those factors, in external and external, that are affecting the performance of our business. You have to be able to identify those factors you know, to make those th better decisions about the timing of acquisitions, product launches, partnerships, you know, among other things. So when you have the ability to look out 18, 24 months, whatever your business planning cycle is, you know, begin to make it possible for your organization to react more quickly to those factors that can, can impact your business. So if you think about what happened in 2008 and you know, where your business was at that time and how you reacted to those set of circumstances. And then you think about now, you know, with the, the, the fear of a, a major debt crisis in Europe. You know, do you have the information? Are you monitoring your business on a regular basis so that you're in a position to make the right decisions um, to put you in, in the right position? So, and this is all just tied back to you know, technology. You need a system. Um, you know, the challenge that we've seen with utilizing Excel in the rolling forecast process is that it's hard to keep those up to date because it's you know, it's not just a single forecast. You know, you're creating a baseline, you're creating new versions, which are typically you know different different versions of Excel that are saved somewhere that you're trying to uh, trying to organize, and then you're you know you're layering in your actuals as you go. You know, trying to understand the ma the impact of major minor you know, alterations to that plan, and you know performing just basic variance and sensitivity analysis. So that's, it's not easy to do in Excel. It's doable, but it's it's pretty difficult to do and do quickly um, to really meet your needs. So many companies are still utilizing Excel for their their planning process. And you know why it may be cumbersome to get the annual plan right. You know it becomes even more more and more difficult once you start rolling that plan. 
The third thing is initiatives planning. And these are really just those, those big what ifs um, that you know, are going on around in, in that planning process. So it's pretty typical that during the planning process, you've got your standard operational plan, planning process that's going on. But this is often very compartmentalized um, you know, by department or maybe even by project. Um, the business unit managers, you know, they own those things and they're planning for them. But you've got these other things that are going on typically across the business and they're more strategic in nature. You know, good examples are you know, new product launches, acquisitions, divestitures, new channel relationships, building a building or a plan, opening new stores. So what we found is that when it comes to planning for initiatives, it's better to have you know, the ability to layer them into the plan. And what I mean by that is you want to be able to consider them separately and not have them mixed into you know, other plans or, or spreadsheets that are floating around the business. So let's plan for those as a separate activity and then you know, give ourselves the opportunity to ask, you know, what if? And you know, what this really comes down to is, you know, is there a separate process for approving or disapproving those plans that really automates you know, the process of, of building the effects on you know, your P&L and your balance sheet and the effects on you know, CapEx into a plan and automates it, you know, so that when you, you know, a certain initiative doesn't get approved, there's not a manual process involved where you're, you know, decoupling all those initiatives and all those things that may happen, those large what ifs from your plan. You know, it's 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 all automated. And then we get into strategy and, edu and execution, which is you know really where we're we're driving towards, you know, that fact-based decision decision making. So we talked about the strategic plan at the beginning of the webinar. And how crucial it is to you know have that cohesiveness between your organization's strategy from a corporate perspective and you know even throughout the organization and tie that into the operational plan. So you know to do that, we're recommending that you create driver-based plans whenever possible. So you know, if you're considering doing this, and really the the goal here is to increase that efficiency and accuracy of the the planning process, you know, for your for in total and for your line managers, you've got to develop those drivers, um, and they've got to be aligned. You know, such that uh, you know, there's a tie between your corporate strategy and the execution of that strategy. So if your strategy is primarily centered around product line expansion, then your organization would be more focused on you know, cost production and product pricing. If you're, you're focused more on acquisitions, then you know, the operational ties you know, may be very different. So I mean, the, the key here is that this is going to ensure that managers are, are they're focusing on the proper drivers you know, based on your overall corporate strategy, plus they're going to be able to get in and out of the plan uh, much more quicker because you're not forcing them to go down to a, a detailed uh, GL account level for every possible GL account to update their forecast or, or update their plan. You know, it's kind of the 80-20 rule. You, you've identified the things that matter most and you build your plan accordingly so that you can build efficiency and accuracy in that process. And at the end of the day, you know, it's really about, you know, knowing the decisions that you need to make before you can move on. And that's done by being able to model out those different alternative scenarios. So you know, moving more towards a you know, fact-based decision-making process. So dashboards and scorecards. So we've gathered a lot of data from source systems. You know, we've got some GL data from you know, the ERP system. We've got some outside KPIs and, and other drivers from uh, maybe some subscriptions or some ones that you've created on your own. We created our plans, um, and now let's just talk a little bit about how we can, how do we get to that data, and, and how do we report on it, so we can ensure that, you know, number one, you have managers who are managing by exception; they're not reviewing a hundred lines of a report every day. They're looking at the things and the KPIs and the true drivers of the business that matter, and drilling down from really drilling down from there, and that really leads to you know holding you know holding them accountable to own that data, own their business, and own those decisions. Um, and it's really about adding intelligence to the data, you know, adding some context. It's not just a bucket of numbers anymore. And this is really what scorecarding is, is all about. And it's true if you're, just, if you're at a point where you're just using it for data visualization and managing by exception, or if you've got a true you know, balanced scorecard methodology that you're uh, either rolling out or, or have rolled out in the past. So when you think about scorecards and, and dashboards, you can't really control process or initiative without understanding you know, the metrics related to those processes or initiatives. Um, you need to be able to uh, you know, plan for them and measure them against actuals to really understand if you're, you're meeting your goals and objectives of those particular initiatives. Operational data, you know, kind of a, the uh, next layer of the cake, if you will. 
And you know, it's really all about including that operational data into your plan. So we talked a lot about financial information and data, but we all also want to be able to include that operational data as well. And you know, just, just some examples. You know, think about things such as you know, service business and be watching the utilization percentages very closely. You know, so they can utilize this type of operational data in the plan to help them, you know, view their business, measure their business, and 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 understand whether or not they should make key decisions. Do they enter a new market? Do they do they raise rates? Is their is their utilization so high that it, it's sending them an indicator that their prices may actually be too high? Which you know, everybody wants to be in that situation, right? So you know, it's really about you know having that information you know at your fingertips, uh, you know, for finance, for the line managers and executives. To being able to better understand the business, so they can you know either op identify you know further opportunities to grow, or maybe even pull back if, if that's the right decision. So again, focus here on better fact make fact uh, based decision, and putting yourself in a position to you know model out the effects of those potential decisions you know before they're made, which is really the key. Um, KPIs and, and their role, you know, having KPIs driving decisions that are being made. It really helps to inform and provide some intelligence to the data that's being generated. And you know, we typically, you know, if you think about you know dashboards and, and scorecards, that's really where you're, you're going to incorporate them. And that's really the underpinnings of, of those tools. I mean, that's driving management by exception and focusing on only the things that matter. And we typically, you know, you know, break out KPIs into two categories: you know, the leading indicators, you know, orders for capital goods, building permits, and new housing starts. And lagging indicators, which includes you know financial statement information, um, you need to be able to reference those those numbers, but they're not necessarily there to really you know drive your business. Long range plans and and scorecards, you know, kind of you know, almost towards the top of the cake here, you know, in in a in a future state you know point of view, and really we're just talking about extending you know off the rolling forecast time horizon, you know, eighteen months, twenty four months, twelve months, whatever it is you decide based on your business cycle. And, and this takes us to be able to look out even further into the future. You know, so try to take a look at you know how those assumptions that you're making today in your annual plans or your rolling forecast, um, and you what and determine what their relationship are, you know are with uh, the long range plan plans. You know, is there a cohesiveness there that we talked about before? And you know, I think one way to do that is to you know turn your your plan into a into a scorecard. So as you progress through the iterations of your rolling forecast. This provides you, you know, kind of a way to measure yourself against those long-range plans. So it's just another tie between corporate strategy, you know, finance and operations, and I mean, or better yet, you know, kind of another way to tie those two together. And the, the question really is, you know, are those decisions you're making today are they in line with your organization's, you know, long-range view, their long-range strategy, and and vice versa? And finally, to to end this uh, end this section, let's just talk about scenario modeling. You know, this is the kind of the nirvana where where you want to be. You know, to be able to model out those decisions. You know, so you can make good decisions quickly with all the data that we've talked about before, and the you know, leveraging technology that's going to be prevalent in a in a corporate performance management application. So, I mean, when you look at all back at all the things we've talked about, rolling forecasts and planning initiatives and utilizing KPIs and operational data. You know, with all this, at the end of the day, you've got to be able to create scenarios using this data. It's got to be easy. It has to be quick and accurate, um, so that if you want to mod, if you want to reforecast every week or have a thousand scenarios, you know, you can do it and not have to worry about what's performance going to be or how much is that going to cost me. So, you know, these scenarios really are just you know, other what if models. What if we open 50 new stores? What if uh, you know a, a, cur a particular currency relationship? Um, it's gonna it's gonna spike because of events in Europe or, or Asia or the Middle East. What if we build a new plant? So these scenarios tend to be you know baked into the model to allow much more flexibility in you know the planning you know for your business and also you know to present those alternatives and, and possible outcomes to the primary strategic business or decision makers uh, in your organization. So the business leaders you know at the end of the day need to be able to see the full you know financial implications of those decisions. Uh, both from a risk and return point of view. So, uh, I mean, I guess finally, one one last thing on this is, you know, you need to be able to add those new, you know, uh, what if scenarios. Like I said before, it, you've got to be able to do it quickly. It's got to be, you know, easy to understand, and you need to be able to do as many as you need to run your business. So, you know, look out for limitations when you're uh, looking at different products to, to do that, because we feel that that's pretty important. So, with that, that.
that is the end of, of my section, uh, and I'm going to turn it back over to John. Great. Thank you very much, Rob. Appreciate that uh, run through. Um, at this point, we're going to get into the first of our three polling questions. I'm going to go ahead and launch that right now. Um, once again, uh, if you're here for CPE credit, uh, you must take this question in order to get the credit. Um, even if you're not here for CPE credit, this is more statistical in nature. And uh, we'd love to see where folks stand. And we'll actually expose the answers to this, uh, this and the other polling questions when we get into the Q&A section later. Uh, so you can see where everyone stands. So um, please uh, take uh, just a few seconds to take a look at this and uh, give an answer. We're also going to follow this question up with a, another polling question that's related. And then we'll move into the second part of this morning's webinar. So we'll go ahead and leave this open for another five seconds, then we'll uh, jump into the next polling question. OK, here we go. So we'll close that one out. We'll jump into the second one. And as you'll see, this second polling question is directly related. And once again, if you'll just take 10 seconds, um, we'd appreciate this. Um, while we're letting folks uh, weigh in here, I'll go ahead and remind you that you can ask questions at any time. Um, we will do our best to get to all the questions uh, when we get to the Q&A period, which will be um, after this next short presentation uh, in our event. Um, also, as a reminder for those who came on late, we will be sending out a link to a soft copy of today's presentations. You'll get that within 24 hours. And the presentations are, in fact, already posted um, at performative.com slash resources. So for anyone who's wondering, uh, how do I get my hands on the, the presentation, soft copy is already available. And we'll send links out to everyone who attended uh, within 24 hours. OK, I'm going to close down this second polling question. Thanks, everyone, for jumping in there. Um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, get us started with our next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Eric Reed, who's a financial analyst at Advanced H2O. Eric has eight years of professional experience in corporate uh, FP&A departments. Uh, he graduated with a BA in Business Administration with a double concentration in Finance and Information Systems. Upon graduation, he was hired at Washington Mutual as a Finance Leadership Program Associate. And after four years, uh, uh, oh, sorry, after four years at Washington Mutual and a two-year stint at Aviation Partners uh, Boeing, Eric joined Advanced H2O in 2011, where he was responsible for financial forecasting. Uh, Eric, please take it away. Thanks, John. All right, so it's a quick agenda here uh, for my presentation. I'm just going to give a quick background on uh, Advanced H2O, uh, talk about some of the challenges and requirements that we had uh, with our forecasting and budget system, uh, the implementation process that we went through with Host Analytics, and some of the benefits that we've seen thus far since going live with Host. So Advanced H2O is headquartered in Mercer Island, Washington, which is just outside of Seattle. Uh, we have five plants throughout the US uh, located in Burlington, Washington, Stockton, California, Dallas, Texas, Hamburg, Pennsylvania, and West Valley, Utah. And we are one of the largest providers of private label bottled water and water-based beverages in the US. Uh, some of the products that we provide um, are spring water, purified water, tea and flavored teas, flavored waters with vitamin enhancements, uh, kids flavored drinks, which include products such as Crayola coolers, um, a couple of new products that we're working on right now too, um, call, uh, a fruit punch and a citrus fruit punch, um, and then also a couple of flavored lemonade uh, variations that uh, we're hoping to have out in the market pretty soon. We have a variety of package sizes that we also use, uh, ranging anywhere from 8 ounce sizes to 4 liter uh, containers, and anywhere from 8 packs to 35 packs, uh, or 1 liter, or, or a single 6 pack, uh, 3 liter, and 4 liter containers, both in flat, tap, flat caps and sport caps. So there's a lot of different uh, options to choose from for our, our customers. Um, which we'll see in a minute here uh, leads to some challenges in our forecasting model. So 
So some of the challenges that we saw uh, with the, the process um, really tie into what Rob had been saying earlier. Um, and just a little more background, I guess. I joined the company in 2011, and when I got here, um, my boss had already kind of identified that there was a need to make a change um, with the process. So I was kind of given, uh, I was kind of thrown into the deep end uh, right away, and, and we were starting a, a reforecast process so I could kind of see what the process looked like currently and kind of go through through that process right away. Um, and wow, I, I, that's all I got to say right now is just how my, my mind was boggled on, on how difficult and, and time consuming their current process was. So their old process consisted, it, it was all Excel based and we had six main Excel files, one for each of our plants and then a, a, a roll up uh, file. And each of these files had upwards of 110 tabs in, a, in them that each needed to be updated in some way or form. So you can imagine that's a lot of manual work right now and, and leads to a lot of areas where mistakes could happen, um, which as Rob was saying earlier, it, it inhibits version control, uh, a lot of broken links or possibilities for broken links. And if there is an error, long nights trying to figure out where that error is at and what tabs and what files need to be adjusted um, and what cells in those tabs need to be adjusted to fix that error and have it roll through the entire process. So when I first got here, uh, Advanced H2O basically did a plan session uh, towards the end of the year for the upcoming year to figure out their plan. And then if time permitted and was requested by our board of directors, they would maybe do one reforecast a year. So you're looking at trying to operate a company with only doing two forecasts a year and, and having accurate data throughout the year to uh, to uh, manage your, your production schedules and uh, give accurate financial projections to our board of directors. As you can probably imagine, not the best way to go about in terms of being up to date and, and the latest changes with your customer requirements, um, changes in the environment, uh, weather changes which drastically impact uh, demand for water or teas, uh, especially in the summer months. And with the old process, with the amount of tabs that needed to be updated and, and files, it made scenario analysis virtually impossible to do um, as any little change would take upwards of two days to five days to incorporate through all of the different uh, various sections that it would need to be incorporated into. Um, and so with the amount of time that it would take to, to do all the different uh, scenarios um, that we might have wanted to look at, it just there just wasn't enough time in the day to, to make that happen. So scenario analysis was virtually uh, not a possibility uh, in the old process and made looking at, uh, you know, what if we wanted to bring in a new line or potentially bring in a new plant and add uh, X amount of additional capacity, uh, how would that affect our revenue? It, it made those uh, scenarios impossible to do. So we would have to do a lot of stuff on the fly and, and just kind of take a best guess at a lot of those uh, situations. And then also with the old process, the data that we ended up with in the format was not in any type of database. And, you know, see, so I've got all these different tabs again uh, going back to Excel, and it just made it very hard to consolidate the data and use it in any type of useful uh, analysis. Um, simple questions that would be asked that if the data was in a useful database should only take a few minutes to, to run and pull would take a couple of days because you have to pull from so many different sources and consolidate it and then do the analysis uh, after that. So some of the things that we were looking for uh, in a solution was that um, first and foremost, um, we needed to have uh, very little IT support because our company is pretty small. We only have one IT person. So we need something that uh, essentially finance could maintain on its own. 
um, and have outside support uh, look into issues that we had had when, when needed. Um, and then also be able to forecast at a very granular level. Um, as I would mentioned earlier, we have a lot of different pack sizes and a lot of different products. Uh, but the way that we forecast and the detail that our board sometimes requires requires us to forecast at a plant level by customer, by product, by ship to location. Uh, so it's it's pretty low level, uh, pretty low level of forecasting, uh, which was one of the reasons why I had so many tabs um, in our Excel files. Uh, but also creates challenges uh, with finding a system that is capable of going down to that level of detail and forecasting. Uh, we also wanted a system that would allow us to make some some high level assumption changes and, and use drivers to uh, flow through the entire uh, forecasting system. Um, you know, where we could just drop in one number and have it flow through, and not have to go through multiple changes of the same driver in multiple different locations. We knew the system was obviously affordable. Um, and one that would allow non-technical users to easily navigate through the interface. So with the business needs um, kind of identified, uh, set out to put together an RFI and sent those out to various vendors um, looking for the best fit uh, for our company in terms of um, having something that could go down the level of detail we needed in terms of forecasting was simple to use, didn't require a lot of support, um, something that we could hopefully implement pretty quickly because uh, we were trying to get the ball rolling on this and, and get out of Excel uh, as our planning tool. So after consulting with a couple of different companies, uh, ultimately decided that host analytics was the best choice for us and ended up signing it in August of 2011. So that set it off our implementation process uh, where we provided various samples of our budget templates and um, walked them through the painful process of what our current process looked like um, and then trying to, to map out, all right, how can we simplify this and how, how will this look, uh, what will this look like in host? So unfortunately, with the timing that we had, we with the sign-in in August, we typically start our plan session in, in August, um, but we're trying to do a very, very aggressive implementation um, in hopes of using host to do the plan for 2012. Um, but with the complexity uh, that we had in terms of the level of detail we had and, and trying to map everything out, we ended up having to, to put implementation on hold for a while while I went back and, and did the old way and, and got our plan done uh, just because we needed to get it done. Uh, so we were kind of went on hold from probably about uh, beginning of October through January uh, while we finished our plan process and then picked it up again uh, towards the end of January with hosts and finished implementation, uh, which host was you know fantastic with um, making sure that all of our issues were addressed, uh, testing out all of our process runs to make sure that the templates would work the way that we thought they would work, um, that we were able to capture the detail that we needed to capture, um, and that it was you know, as efficient and, and easy as possible. Um, so once these test runs were completed, um, working with some of their solution analysts, uh, we were able to finally go live in March of 2012. And since that time, we have already seen much, much faster turnarounds in our forecast. Um, from from going from a once a year plan session and a once a year reforecast, we have gone uh, from doing those two times a year to now doing a uh, monthly forecast where we can go in and do our revenue forecasting and bring it all the way down to the PL level and and um, and see the impact that we're going to have each month. Um, so what would take before two to f three months for a reforecast now takes uh, about three weeks, um, two to three weeks um, from start to finish. And so we're able to do a, a forecast each month now. Um, our plan process, which before would take upwards of 
four months. Um, right now I have scheduled to take about two. Uh, we're going to be starting here in the next month with just gathering some of our, our basic uh, volume information from our sales guys and um, starting to get that put in the system with a target date to end plan by the beginning of November. Uh, so dramatic uh, cut down in, in process time um, and also uh, the amount of work required by other FTE in our company. Uh, here. Along with the improved process time, uh, there's also been much higher um, data quality. Uh, there's less points of, uh, there's less sections that are uh, vulnerable to human error uh, as most, most must uh, excuse me, much of it is automated now, so I don't have to worry about broken links or having gone in and did somebody enter in the right number in this spot for this driver uh, because it's it's the same driver. The same driver will um, flow through all the different tabs and different templates uh, without me having to go in into each of individual tab and enter in that same number in the same cell. Um, and so that just gives us a, gives us a much higher confidence in the in the data that we're looking at and allows us to do um, a lot more of analysis um, and be be sure that what we're looking at is is truly what's going to happen um, along with that the ability to actually do scenario analysis now uh, with the forecast only taking a month now and and small changes uh, being able to quickly flow through the entire system, uh, just having that ability has just been awesome. Um, with the, the amount of growth that our company is seeing right now, um, you know, we're still continually looking at what would the impact be if we're going to add a new plant or add new lines to current plants and to be able to turn around and, and tell our board, all right, well, if we add this much capacity with these volumes for these customers, you know, we're going to see this much additional revenue or this much additional to our bottom line. So the next step for us now is to continue to look at how we can incorporate hosts more within our company and and, and expand some of the functionality it has because hosts have some have some great features in terms of um, executive reports and um, being able to tie in with their accounting systems and, and use it for close, which we're co currently not doing, uh, but is something I'm going to be looking into within the next year is working with our accounting departments and, and how we can get them integrated with host and, and use that to hopefully shorten up our close process and, and just turn this more into a robust uh, forecasting system uh, for our company and, and just utilize all the benefits that the host has. So we're Definitely looking forward to what the next year is going to bring as we continue to explore um, explore the growth that we have between Advanced H2O and Host and and how it can continue to help us uh, grow and, and be proactive versus reactive in, in looking at data. So with that, I would like to turn it back over to John. Right. Thank you, Eric. It's always nice to hear uh, from people who are actually um Implementing Solutions Live that we're here to talk about uh, in general. And we do have one more polling question. Let's uh, let's uh, knock that one out really quickly here. I'm going to launch it right now. Um, once again, if you're here for CPE credit, we do need you to take this. But even if you're not here for CPE credit, um, please uh, give us 10 seconds and, and uh, take this. And then we'll take a quick look at the consolidated um, answers in just a moment. Also, a quick reminder, when you step off of the webinar, because we're getting close to the end here, when we step off uh, in the, um, at 10 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 1 o'clock Eastern, uh, you'll be prompted to take a quick survey. Please do uh, give us one minute of your time. We'd like to know how we can do better the next time. Plus, if you would like to be connected with either of today's speakers, Rob or Eric, uh, it's just a click of the mouse to uh, request that, and then we're more than happy to make that connection. All right, at this point, we're going to close out. And um, let's just real quickly here take a, a review, as I promised earlier, uh, of the results from the polling questions. Uh, and here I'll share out the first polling question, which of the following is the highest priority area for improvement at your company? Uh, budgeting, reporting, consolidation, analysis, or uh, nothing, or I suppose other. Um, at this time. Uh, so Rob, um, taking a look at this is interesting. Analysis is pretty much 2x. Uh, the number is 2 and 3. 
Um, is that fairly typical for what you see amongst clients? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think there's a you know there's a real focus on you know core needs, budgeting and planning and forecasting, and you know there's there's also a real uh, push and you know, kind of acceptance of you know using drivers and KPIs to you know, to manage manage by exception exception. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So I think this is right on. Uh, and Eric, um, when you got to H2O, um, was it that the whole system was so broke you could hardly do any of this, or, or uh, what was your highest priority at the time? Uh, it was difficult. Um, the biggest thing was, you know, definitely improving the process time because it took so long to get everything done. Um, you know, budgeting to the point where you can only do it twice a year. Uh, analysis, oh my goodness. I mean, I'd have to literally pull from three different sources to pull and then consolidate everything and then break it out when if everything was in, in some type of database, it should have been, you know, a five-minute exercise, but it would end up taking me two to three days, so. Uh, I have to say, I pity you. I, I've never seen anything as bad as six roll-up spreadsheets of 110 tabs each. That's just madness. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure you're happy to be out from under that. Um, the second poll question of the areas of improvement, uh, one of those that need the most change, process um, is top, and then technology number two. Um, Rob, is that uh, fairly typical? Yeah, I, I think it is. You know, um, I mean, certainly there, there's there's a people and process issue, you know, related to all this, but, um, yeah, I mean, technology is going to be a big, big component, but it's all about the underlying process as well. So, yeah, I think it's pretty accurate. And, and Eric, um, how did... Uh, did did your processes change significantly when you um, went to the new uh, software, and um, how have your business partners uh, responded to that? Um, our processes have changed a little bit. You know, it's just trying to become more efficient, so we've been able to cut out certain aspects of our old process. Um, and for the most part, everybody's been on board. Um, you know, the key the key people were the ones that were actually, you know, initiating this and saying we, we need to change this because we can't do what we need to do in the right. time that we have to do it. So that was something that was definitely beneficial, and, and I didn't have a lot of hoops to jump over in that regard. So. Gotcha. Um, and speaking of which, um, one last polling result. <clears throat> And this question was, collaboration between finance and operations in my company's budgeting and planning effort is non-existent, limited, acceptable, but needs improvement in where it needs to be. Um, where was H2O before and after now, Eric? Um, I guess that would depend a little bit on how you ask. If you had asked me coming from where I had come from and having the systems that I've been already working on, I would have said they were totally unacceptable <laughs> um, and definitely need uh, some improvement. Um, some of the other guys here, they're probably like, oh, we can kind of deal with this. But, um, you know, I, to me, they definitely needed improvement um, and just needed to be fixed. So, Well, it's an interesting point you make. It's hard to know what you're missing if you haven't lived with something better. Yeah. Um, and I, I've come into a lot of situations in finance where that's been the case. And then when you get it in place, people's eyes are opened up. Um, a quick question, uh, Rob, um, is uh, from the audience here. Is host a cloud-based solution? Yes, it is. It is a software as a service solution, and you know what that what that really means is, I mean, number one, access from anywhere, anytime, as long as you have an internet connection and a username and password. And mm -hmm. number two, you know, no real, you know, worries about the technology side of it. You know, we handle all that for you. Um, so there's there's you know, no equipment to buy, no upgrades to go through. We handle that. Up. We come up with you know, we have monthly updates, quarterly releases, and that's you know done by you know in our data centers by our people. Excellent. Um, one more really quick question before we get to the uh, the close up stuff. Um, how many spreadsheets does H two O use now in your budgeting and planning process? Um. Just a few. Uh, there's nothing. I mean, it, it's more. It's really ad hoc files just to do like support. Um, to do some calculations that uh, right now is, is still easier to do outside of the system, um, and then to enter those numbers into into host. Uh, but it's nothing like before. You know, it's like a file here or there with a tab or two, maybe. Right. Um, it's just more to to do some of the stuff that we don't really have in the system. It's just kind of offline stuff that we just want to to calc. Um, and then right. take that data and enter it in. 
Gotcha. Great. Well, I'll tell you what, with that, we are running to the end of our hour. Um, so first off, a, a big thanks to Rob and Eric uh, for your time and uh, the information you brought today. I greatly appreciate it, and uh, thanks for uh, joining us this morning. Thank you, John. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Great. Uh, pleasure having you. Um, once again, you'll be prompted to take a short survey. We greatly appreciate your giving us a minute of your time to do that. Uh, please join us at performative.com at any time to ask additional questions you may have and continue this conversation online or, or frankly, any other questions around uh, subjects in finance, accounting, and treasury. Uh, if you have any questions about CPE credit, please contact Tanya Walsh. You can see her email at the bottom there. Um, she is uh, more than happy to uh, help you out and make sure you get credit. Uh, finally, uh, another thanks to Host Analytics, our sponsor today, for their generosity. We not only uh, got great information today, uh, but as always, the information came to you at no cost, which is part of uh, what we're all about here at Performative. So we love that. Thanks to Host Analytics. And thanks to everyone for giving us an hour of your time this morning. And with that, we'll let you go. When I shut this down in just a moment, you will be prompted uh, to take that quick survey. So thank you so much, and we hope to see you again at another event on Performative or at performative.com online. Take care, everyone.